Welcome to the uh, fourth lecture in this class. A couple of logistical things. One, your homework one was due yesterday. Um, you have a late day budget. If you haven't finished it, you have a total of four late days, so another, I guess, two days that you can use on one homework. A total of seven for the semester. You use four of them now. You only got three left for all the other three homeworks combined. So, you know, you, you do what you have to do. Um, one little thing to flag, maybe, the homework is designed to take anywhere from 20 to 40 hours. Um, if it takes you uh, less than 20 hours, that's great. You're going really fast. Um, if it takes you more than 40 hours, you're not asking for enough help, or you just don't have the right background. So keep that in mind. If you see yourself busy, let's say 100 hours on one homework, uh, please come ask for help uh, more frequently and, and sooner. Any logistical questions? Oh, actually, one other logistical thing. Uh, the register actually increased the class size, and so everybody who was on the wait list was moved in. Um, I know undergraduates and concurrent enrollment students cannot make it on the wait list, so they're still out. Um, but we dropped a note on EdSTEM. Let us know if you're undergrad or concurrent enrollment, you still want to get into the class, send us an email on the staff mailing list, and we'll take a look at your homework one and get a sense from that whether to request for you to be admitted into the class or not. Okay. Yes? Well, sometimes you have to sit and wait a little bit. I guess it depends. Yeah, I guess you could interleave it. You could, you know, get something going and then do something else. Um, but let's say you just kind of nonstop worked on it. You type, you wait, you type, you wait, something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, today we're going to cover latent variable models. So, just to give a bit of context, we've looked at autoregressive models, we've looked at flows, in which case, in some sense, all the random variables were observed. We're very directly modeling the distribution over x, um, and that'll be different now. In latent variable models, we will, in some sense, have the assumption that maybe there's a lower dimensional piece of information that really encodes what is incarnated in x, and if we can capture that lower dimensional simpler representation z, then that's a much more compact representation to represent the data and in that space, it might be easier to do things like interpolate between data points, or it might be a good way to compress the data, of course, or it could be a good representation to then learn a classifier on top or yet do other things with. So autoregressive models looked like the model on the left. Latent variable models will look like this. Flow models looked a bit like this too, but in flow models, the z stayed in the same dimensionality as x which limited it a little bit in what it could do. Um, here we won't be making that assumption. There will be other uh, important differences. So, a bit more motivation um, by example. Imagine you want to represent this image. Um, one way to think of it is that is, you know, pixel by pixel representing the image. Another way to think of it is, hey, there's a corgi on the left, which is red and white. There's another corgi more towards the middle which is also red and white and has a floppy left ear. Um, there's a third corgi all the way on the right, which is tricolor. And then in the background, there is a wood bench and it's in a park. And maybe what I just described is something you'd want the model to somehow naturally know about. I'm not saying we're capable of doing that fully with the models we're covering today or any models for that matter, but the hope could be that a good generative model would be able to take an image, effectively project it onto the explanation I just gave, and then reproject it back out to what you see in this image. So why latent variable models from a, you know, more complete uh, perspective compared to autoregressive models? Autoregressive models are slow to sample because all the pixels, that is observational dimensions, are assumed to be dependent on each other, so you have to wait for the previous pixel to be sampled, to be able to sample your current pixel. As you know from the homework, you can do caching, which 
means you don't have to do at least any repeat computation, but you still have to wait till the sampling is done of the previous pixel before you can fully sample the next pixel. Um, even if there is no true independencies across the pixels, it could be that they are conditionally independent, conditioned on some side information, like the description of what's in the image. For example, exactly what the corgi, uh, what the corgis look like could be independent of each other. Um, given we know that there are corgis in certain locations, whereas if we just have a pixel level model, we'll only know where these corgis are once the pixels are being generated. We'll only know then that they're not overlapping or are overlapping and so forth. And so having that higher level information can actually tell us, actually the way you render these three corgis is decoupled in this case because they're separated from each other in the picture. Um, and the hope is that if somehow we can capture that latent structure, um, things can lead to better representations, but also in a faster sampling. Because you just sample Z, and then you, from there, you can generate the entire X. You don't have to wait for the previous pixel to generate the next one. Um, sometimes it's possible to design a latent variable model by hand, effectively, with an understanding of the causal process that generates the data. Like a special case of this could be, maybe you could have a um, latent variable model that is hard-coded where maybe your decoder is a graphics engine, right? How does graphics work? Traditional graphics, you describe the objects that you're gonna be rendering, you describe their coordinates, and the renderer turns that into an image. You can imagine that all that description of what's gonna be in the scene, that's your Z, and you can then hope that maybe you can learn an encoder from image into Z, and then the decoder is hard-coded, that's your causal process that you understand how rendering happens. And in fact, towards the end of class, uh, the end of not this class, but the, the course, we'll have a guest lecture on nerves, uh, neural radiance fields, and it's a bit like that. It's assumed that rendering happens in a succession where things in the back, then things to the front, occluded things in the back, and so you can have um, stronger priors over how scenes are set up. So I think it is interesting to keep thinking about that. Clearly nerves are some of the you know, most interesting recent approaches to, to generating imagery while the latent representation knows more about what's, what's happening behind. But today we're not gonna assume any of that. We're not gonna assume any specific structure like, oh, a graphics engine will turn it into uh, a scene. We're gonna hope that it just emerges from the data. So, as you know from previous lectures, I like to start very simple, the simplest version of each model and build up from there. So what's the simplest version of a latent variable model? There is X is our data. So X is a data point. And then this Z is our latent. And in this lecture, essentially Z will always be the latent and that's pretty common in, in the literature and X will be the data. So in this specific model, um, in the very simplest case, k equals one, you just sample a single variable z, that could be zero or one, sam coin, coin toss effectively, takes one value or the other value, and the condition on that, you generate x, which um, could, let's say, be some, you know, Bernoulli, so also zero, one variable that maybe comes after some deep neural net processing on z, you come out with a sample uh, distribution for x, and you sample x. Z could be vector valued, so it could be multiple zero, one variables that together encode information about the scene, or it could be other type of data. Um, I'll often talk about images because it's easier when, when it's very concrete to think about this, but so for Z you could say, is there a car present in the scene or not? Is there a dog present in the scene or not? All these things could be sitting in Z, and then the neural network turns that into an image X that incarnates those pieces of information. So the way you work with this model, you sample from PZZ, actually pretty similar to flow models last week in that regard. Um, that gives you your Z, and then from there, you sample your X from th P theta X given Z. The way these models are gonna be set up is that um, consistently, we'll choose a distribution PZ that's easy to work with, that's easy to sample from, and we'll also choose a distribution P 
theta of x given z that's easy to work with. P theta x given z will typically be a deep neural network that processes z into then an output distribution for x. To evaluate the likelihood, you just evaluate this over here. Note that unlike with flow models where there was essentially z one-on-one -on -one mapped to a corresponding x, um, and then we have that log determinant scaling factor to evaluate the likelihood to account for how volumes change in the transformation. Here it's a bit different how it's set up. This is assuming discrete. You see the summation. The probability of a certain value for x is the sum over all possible z. So if z can take on 100 values, you have a sum over 100 terms there. The probability of that particular z multiplied with the probability of x given z. So x in principle will be caused by multiple z's that each cause this x to emerge possibly. Um, so that's, that's the model as expressed exactly. Then to train, you maximize the log probability of the data. So i indexes into data points. So maximize the sum of the log probabilities of each data point xi. And if you expand it, so we're really using this thing here to get this expression here, this is what you have. Note that even though there's a product of probabilities here and there's a log, we cannot split it up because there's a sum there. It's a log of a sum of product of probabilities. It's not a log of a product of probabilities. So this, this sum prevents us from just making just a, just a log of sum of logs. Okay, so then if we want to get the representation for a data point, we feed in x and get out z. We'll want something for that too. Um, in principle, as we look at the model here, and we'll start with that, you can just use Bayes' rule, right? We have pz, we have px given z. Um, we can find pz given x using Bayes' rule, right? pz given x equals p, um, x given z times pz over px, right? Now, it does turn out that this is not necessarily easy to compute, but in principle, mathematically, that is the answer to your question. Um, but a lot of the work we'll do is actually realizing that this is a bit intractable. This summation here can also be intractable and how to deal with that. But, so, but in principle, in a small scale scenario, we can go in either direction quite easily and do it exactly. Okay. So we've seen some motivation and the very basic kind of underlying model we're going to be using. Um, now we'll look at how to train them. Uh, we'll look at exact scenarios, then we'll use that sampling-based scenarios, and then we'll look at the variational lower bound and uh, other name for the same thing, the evidence lower bound. We'll look at how to optimize the objectives that we uh, propose, and then we'll look at many variations. So the first part of the lecture will be all about getting the formulation correct essentially the algorithmic part. And the second part of the lecture will be about getting the details right about what really should be the neural net architecture that you put in place such that this thing actually succeeds. Actually, the second part, Kevin, you're going to be giving that part. You knew that. Um, <laughs> um, so, starting with training these models. So, scenario one. Base case, to understand the simplest case that could come up, um, z can only take on a small number of values, which means the exact objective is tractable. That summation becomes easy to compute because, as I said, we're going to assume pz is simple to evaluate and sample from. And um, in this case, we don't even need to sample. We just enumerate all z's. And then p theta x given z again, we, by design, I'm going to choose it to be something easy. It doesn't need to be computationally cheap. It could be a very large neural network going from z to x, but it's something that is a straightforward calculation uh, that we can do. So the exact objective is tractable then. We can just directly optimize it. Scenario two, z can take an impractical number of values to enumerate, so we need to approximate. You might wonder, how about optimizing PC, learning the prior. Actually, it's sometimes done, and we'll see examples later when Kevin gets into the details that we can also learn PZ at times. On the one hand, you might say, I don't want to learn PZ because I want my data to go from whatever complex distribution it is into a simple space. And how can I force it to land in a simple space is by deciding what PZ is. 
if I make PZ simple enough, then somehow the data is forced to be somehow, the data distribution is forced to morph into this simpler space where presumably um, it's more meaningful. When embeddings are close together, that means the images are very similar, which, for example, wouldn't necessarily be true in directly in pixel space. Now, you can go very extreme, and often, you know, at least in the early goings, people will say, let's make PZ a Gaussian, or um, just binary random variables for PZ. Um, a little harder to optimize when PZ has uh, discrete valid random variables, but it can be done. Um, but Gaussian is maybe the most natural choice. Um, it can be still a little restrictive. You might want something that can model just a bit more than just a Gaussian in the embedding space. Why is that? If it's just a Gaussian, every latent variable is independent. So go back to the example I said earlier when I said, is this variable saying you know, whether it's a dog or not? Another one is saying, is there a cat or not? That, that's kind of our hope, right? Another one is saying, is there a horse or not? Another one is saying, is there an airplane or not? Another one is saying, is there a desk or not? And so forth. You could expect that in your data, there are correlations there. That maybe when there's a dog, it's maybe a little more likely there's maybe another dog than when there is no dog, or maybe when um, there is a car, there might be likely another car, because um, it might be a street scene with many cars and so forth. And so if you just force PZ to be a Gaussian, you force every variable in the Z space to be independent, which means you're not capturing such dependencies. So even though simple is desirable, too simple might just not allow you to achieve a good model of your data. So there are some trade-offs there. Okay, so let's look at a very simple example. We're going to model a latent variable model where x is, you know, uh, let's say, think of it as like just a two-dimensional vector. x is where your data lives, and there are three values z can take on, and x is distributed according to a Gaussian, multivariate Gaussian, conditioned on Z. So it's just a mixture of Gaussians. If K equals three, which we'll see on the slide next, um, this is just a mixture of three Gaussians distribution that we're modeling here. And then the training objective becomes maximize theta, the parameters of this model. In this case, um, we fixed the mixture coefficient, we fixed the prior, so each Gaussian bump is equally likely to be occurring, and then for each Gaussian, we can learn the mean and the covariance in this case. Very simple. We obviously don't need um, you know, a special lecture on latent variable models if this is all we're going to do, but I think it's a good starting point. So if we train this model, let's say with gradient descent, um, on the top left, we have the training data. Then um, we train the model, but at epoch zero is just randomly initialized. We sample from it from our three Gaussians, and we see that, yes, we get three clusters because there's three Gaussians in our model, but they don't land in the right spot. As we go through multiple epochs of training, we see that these three Gaussians actually shift to the three modes of the distribution, which is, in this case, naturally what we'd be hoping for, and we have a very good model of this very simple data set, but it is essentially all that's needed here, and it's the base case. Any questions about the simple scenario here? Okay, let's keep going. Now, what if Z can take on many values? Okay, not three values like we just saw, but maybe millions of values, maybe even more. Imagine Z is continuous, then it can take on infinitely many values, or if Z is discrete and there's zero one variables, there's a hundred of them, that's two to the 100 possible values your Z vector can take on. You cannot enumerate all of those as you try to evaluate the likelihood. But because we know z comes from a distribution, and this summation here, that's just an expectation with respect to z, we can just replace that expectation with samples from the z distribution. And so this part here becomes effectively this thing over here. So for each term here, um, here on the left, there could be, I guess, too many to handle. Here we take some capital K that, that's reasonable. Maybe we take for each xi, each data point xi, we take 10 samples z. And then um, 
put those terms in in there. Then you can run stochastic gradient descent on the approximate objective. Um, and every epoch, you can resample your z's if you want to. And hopefully, um, this approximation will do well for you. Now, the challenge with prior sampling, obviously, when you do prior sampling, it's nice. It's simple. All I need to do is sample from z. You have a clean objective to optimize. Question? Yeah, so the question is, what is big K? Um, it's a hyperparameter that you can choose because the more, I guess, Zs you sample, the longer it takes to evaluate this objective and to then do a gradient step. Um, but then also, in some sense, the more precise the approximation is, whereas then the smaller your K is, um, the faster you can evaluate and get a gradient step. So it's a bit like, you know, it's almost like batch size. It's a, it's a bit of a parameter like that. Mm -hmm. Yes, question. Um, is this an unbiased or biased estimate of the objective? Um, well, the this part is an unbiased estimate of this term here. Uh, it will have the correct expectation. Um, now, after you apply the log, um, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll leave it to you to think that through. Um, I don't, I don't have the answer at the top of my head. But the part that you're replacing has the correct expectation. The, yeah, the nonlinearity might, might make it um, biased as possible. What is true is that if you sample infinitely often, you will get the correct objective. So if you're willing to sample infinitely often, this is um, the correct objective. You just don't have the time to do that. And in fact, it's even more tricky than that. Imagine you're trying to model some data, right? Um, we have some data points x in, in 2D. Some others are here. Some others are here. Bunch of data points. And so in this case, there is two, four, six, eight, nine, nine clusters effectively. All right. Now, imagine I'm doing a pretty good job with a mixture of Gaussians, I got lucky. I chose nine mixture components. So I'm going in a scenario where everything is going my way, right? So there's nine mixture components. These mixture components land pretty much in the right regions. So everything's going my way. And now I sample my Z, okay? Let's say this here is my XI that I currently care about. And I'm gonna now sample, sample Z. If I sample Z from the prior, then I have equal probability to land on any one of those nine clusters. And so only one in nine times, on average, will my Z land in the cluster that corresponds to this Xi. Every other time, it will effectively put us in another cluster. And if my Z lands over here for this cluster, then under this, you know, the Gaussian bum that's sitting here, the probability of X is, sure, there's a little bit of a contribution, but it's near zero because it's so far away. And so when I look at evaluating these sums here, one over K, sum from one through K of probability of X given Z, most of these terms will be near zero, not really contribute. And then the one out of nine times I'm lucky, I'll have a term that contributes. And so when I'm doing the training, I'm essentially wasting Eight out of nine of my cycles really should have chosen 10, 10 uh, mixture components. But uh, I'm losing eight out of nine of my compute cycles on terms that are essentially useless for modeling the data. So that's a tricky, tricky part here. In this case, it was I would lose eight out of nine. But imagine your Z is 100-dimensional. Uh, There's two to the 100 possibilities. And a specific X might only match up with one or two out of those two to the 100 possibilities, and now you have zero chance to get the correct Z, and all your terms will effectively be zero and contribute nothing to the objective. And so you're just busy, 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 never getting a lucky Z and never getting any signal. So clearly, I mean, the intuition here is that 
we shouldn't just sample z from the prior, we should make sure that we get z's that are correct for the x's that they're going to be paired up with. So, um, now, to, to formalize this a little bit, let's do a little side sidetrack on importance sampling, because that's what we're going to want to use here. So, in importance sampling, let's say you want to compute an expectation of a function f of z, where z is sampled from pz, but it's hard to sample from pz, or the samples from pz are not very informative. So those are the two scenarios where importance sampling is very relevant. Scenario two is our scenario. I'm not going to go into scenario one, but just so you know, that's another case where importance sampling can come in handy. So a very simple exa example for um, two is imagine I have a pz that maybe looks like this, right? Similar to what we're talking about. And then maybe uh, my f of z looks something like this, okay? Then really what I, what I want is I really want samples over here, which I'm naturally not going to get when I sample from PZ because there's not a lot of probability there, but those are the only terms that contribute to that expectation or meaningfully contribute to the expectation. That's so when I just sample from PZ, most of my samples go to waste. Same thing was happening over here. This P theta X given Z, most would go to waste. That's the counterpart of that function FC I was drawing on the slide over here. Okay, what's important sampling? I'm interested in expectation with respect to PZ. I know that's what I care about, but I know that I want my samples to fall over here. If I want to go force my samples over there, obviously I'm not sampling anymore from PZ, so I'm going to introduce a correction factor for what I'm doing, and important sampling gives us the formalism to get the right correction factor in place. So, this is the expectation we're looking at. We multiply and divide by QZ, which is the distribution we're going to be sampling from, that is also easy to sample from, and hopefully will be focused in the area we care about. Then we call this an expectation again, because the QZ at the top here, sum over Z, QZ, expectation with respect to QZ. Um, and then we say, oh, we have an expectation again now where we sample from QZ instead of from PZ. And now we sample, and this is our sample approximation when we sample from QZ, and we see that we have a correction factor here with the ratio between PZ and QZ. So whenever QZ is very high and PZ is very low, we'll weigh things down because it's places where QZ is putting a lot of samples, but PZ wouldn't have done it, and the other way around. Um, in the example I just described, really what would happen is usually we get weighted down because we're going to put our samples in a place where PZ is low. We're going to explicitly put them there and then we're going to get weighted down. But at least we have meaningful samples that we care about that give us signal uh, as opposed to putting them where PZ was high and we get nothing in terms of signal for FC. So this can always be done, by the way. Any Anytime you need to compute expectation with respect to one distribution, you can choose another distribution and then use that. Uh, correction factor, the ratio there, to, uh, to account for sampling from the other distribution. So, in our latent variable model, what does that mean? We have that expectation over here, over z's. We replace that with a sampled version where we sample from q, which is an alternative distribution, and then we have the correction factor right there, p over q. What would be a good distribution for QZ? Because now we have a new hyperparameter in some sense. What QZ are we going to choose to make this work well? Well, how about the Z that is the Z's that are essentially most likely given the XI I'm trying to model right now? That seems a pretty natural choice. And in fact, later we'll formally see that's the best choice. Um, but just intuitively, it also is a natural choice to choose that. And so you can use Bayes rule to come up with what that uh, distribution is for Z, um, and then hopefully you can sample from it, um, but likely it's not so obvious uh, how to sample from it, because essentially the expression here 
is not a distribution you can easily sample from. Um, it's this, you know, multiplication of different things, and that's very different from just sampling from, let's say, PZ, which is just a distribution you choose. But here you have a simple distribution multiplied with a neural network that gives you something over X, and you divide out the probability of X, which, and by the way, this thing is actually this complicated thing up here that you're already having trouble modeling. So we're gonna do more, we have to do more work to get anywhere near that, but that's the idea. We're gonna sample from some QZ that hopefully gets close to this. So, how do we find a QZ that's close to what we want? Uh, the variational approach to doing this says we can't directly use the P that we want, so instead we propose a parameterized distribution Q. We know we can work with easily, which in this case means sample from easily, and try to find a parameter setting that makes it as good as possible. So maybe our QZ will again be a Gaussian, but there will be a Gaussian that we try to move as close as possible to this posterior, which we really would want to sample from. I haven't said yet how we move our QZ in that position, but that's going to be the goal. Now, one natural solution then is say, okay, I'm going to find a QZ that minimizes the KL divergence between QZ and P theta Z given XI. So I'm looking at a very specific data sample XI. I'm going to do that for every sample. I have a different QZ for every one of them. I have my sample. I'm going to solve this optimization problem. Obviously, we're still working to the final solution. We're not going to want to solve an optimization problem for every data point separately. But as we work to our solution, we're now solving an optimization problem, a KL divergence minimization, to find a really good QZ, the mean and the variance of a Gaussian, let's say, that brings QZ as close as possible to P theta Z given XI. Now we said this thing, P theta, isn't easy to sample from Z given XI. Um, how can we even count on that this KL being easy to optimize? Well, let's unpack it. Um, this thing here, well, the KL is the expected log odds ratio, so just the definition of KL going to line two. Then we unpack this posterior of Z given XI into the denominator here, same thing as on the previous slide, just base rule. Um, then we, since it's a product and uh, division of multiple probabilities and there's a log in front, we can just make it a sum and sub addition and subtraction of logs of these things and we get this thing over here. Now let's take a look at all these terms. The last term is actually pretty tricky. Log P theta Xi is a distribution we're trying to model is a thing that we are very hard, having a very hard time getting a handle off. But um, it turns out that um, if you if you look at the um, interaction here, there's no z, the z doesn't explicitly appear here. It's just something that's independent of z, and so the expected value of something with respect to z of this thing is just some constant. Our Q does not affect this because our Q, our distribution over Z always sums to one, no matter what. And so it's not going to affect what we end up over here. It's always going to be that number, whatever it is. We just don't know the number, but it's going to be the same number no matter what. The terms that do have Q, Z in it, either implicitly or explicitly, the Zs are in there, um, we have to work with. And so this is the minimization that we have to solve. Let's look at these terms, log QZ. We chose QZ to be easy to work with, so that should be easy to evaluate. PZ given Z, we chose PZ to be easy to evaluate and work with, so that's again an easy term. And P theta XI given Z, we also chose to be easy to work with. Um, in practice, the QZ might be a Gaussian, PZ given Z might be another Gaussian, and P theta XI given Z might be a neural network mapping from Z to a distribution over X. And so now we have this optimization problem here where every term is easy to, to work with. We can solve for the optimal QZ. Once we've found the optimal QZ, we can sample from it and use the important sampling adjustment to compute the expectation that we want to then uh, continue with our latent variable modeling. So a lot is going on, but at least we understand that we can do this. Now, right now, for all Xi, all data points Xi, 
we would be solving this, this KL minimization problem, which is, you know, we're solving this big optimization problem every step along the way just to generate the samples that we want for it. We have to solve an optimization problem in the inner loop for every data point. That's just too much. So what people do, they amortize this, meaning they say, well, instead of finding, let's say, a separate mean and covariance for each data point xi to match the posterior for z, instead I'm going to set up a neural network, let's say, that maps from x space to z space and predicts the right mean and covariance corresponding to that xi. Um, and now you have one optimization problem where all of these participate in, but it's only one problem, and you parameterize your distribution differently, right? So here, you effectively are trying to solve for mu i, sigma i, for all data points i. Here, you're just solving for phi. What is phi? Well, phi will typically be a neural network that helps you map from x to z. What does that really mean? Map from x to a mu that depends on x and a sigma that depends on x, all parameterized by phi. Um, so you can effectively reuse, learn the pattern of what z you want to end up with. Also to be clear, you might not actually output sigma here. Um, you might output a diagonal version of it and you might output a log sigma instead of sigma to not have to deal with the fact that things need to be um, positive and so forth. But conceptually, the key idea here is to go from solving many problems for many individuals mu i, sigma i, to get with these. And by the way, you still then have separate mu i's and sigma i's, they just come through the neural network. Because if you feed in x i, you actually do get a different mu x i and a different sigma x i out for different x i. It's just that it's parameterized. And so the neural network tells you the answer rather than running this optimization every single time to get the mean and variance. Yes? So it's a good question. Um, as we solve this and try to find our Q, it's the Q that's optimal depends on the current choice of theta, which is something we're learning. And so as you update theta, you also again have to redo it and find a new Q. Now the beauty is if you make a small update to theta, probably it's a small update to phi. And so you, you kind of alternate between them um, and move them in sync along. Um, but yeah, that is part of what happens. You have you're, you're we are doing the alternating optimization between the theta and the phi. And when you have your new phi, you can sample your z's. You can use that to construct your objective for theta and then update your theta and go again. Oops, skipped over something, I think. Yeah. So, pictorially, I mean, we went through a lot of math, and there's a lot of math behind the scenes. Pictorially, it's often just described this way you have a z, which you have p theta x given z goes to x, and then you have a network q phi that maps back in the other direction, and we're solving this problem here, while, you know, plus we're solving max over theta sum over i um, log p theta x i, which by the way expands into a sampled version of, you know, x i depending on, on z that was sampled. Now, what could this be? As I said, Q phi um, essentially outputs a mean and a variance, or equivalently, we could, um, um, you know, say that Z is equal to a mean that depends on X plus some epsilon that gets sampled from Z normal distribution, unit normal, and then multiplied with the variance. So that's how you can get an actual Z out from such a network. Okay, so this gives us the first version of the VAE, the variational autoencoder, specifically the importance weighted autoencoder. Um, our objective right, is the sum over all data points, that's I, the log probability of that data point. This thing here is our approximation of P theta XI, which really is, you know, integral or sum over all Z of P, Z, Z, times p theta xi given z, 
But again, we don't want to enumerate all Zs, so instead we are sampling Zs, we're correcting for the fact that we're sampling from Q instead of PZ, and then this term is still there. At the same time, to make sure this is actually effective, the Q that we use is one that's helpful in uh, getting signal to optimize P theta, we also minimize this KL. Um, my team know, kind of funny that we these two optimizations now, but that's just the way it comes out. In fact, when we go further in lecture, you'll see with some alternative derivations, you just end up with effectively the same two terms. You just add them together and optimize both as one objective. Um, it's just that one side depends on the Q phi's and the other side depends, you optimize the Q phi and the other one optimize the P theta. So you can just put them together, maximize term one minus term two. Any questions here? Because in some sense, this is the basic version of everything we're going to cover today. If this is clear, you're in really good shape. If it's not clear, it's a good time to ask questions. Yeah. One trivial question, but um, so I noticed in the objective you have P theta of X to the Z, and then in the um, amateurized problem, you have P theta of Z given X. So right, are, down here. You're taking the same neural network with the parameterized by theta, and instead of trying to get X and Z in the subsequent problem, you're trying to sort of reverse it. Yeah, that's a good question. What does P theta Z given XI mean in the notation I'm using here? There's no neural network associated with that. So all there is is there is PZZ, there is P theta um, X given Z, and there is um, Q phi Z given X. Those are the only things that we have available to us. And when I write P theta Z given XI, really what I'm writing is um, or should be interpreted as applying Bayes' rule, meaning I'm writing P um, Z given XI times P XI over P Z. To make it more precise, add in um, hold on, I did that the wrong way. Let me because I'm ending up with the same thing at the top, which is not what I want. Um, I'm writing, so Bayes' rule flips it. It would be xi given z with a theta here, pzz divided by um, p um, xi. And um, it's just saying that, you know, I applied Bayes' rule using the original distribution that I'm looking to uh, find. It's not saying that there's a neural network that incarnates this direction. In some sense, we want that neural network and the Q phi is the one that's doing it for us. Um, that's the one that actually does go in that direction. Yeah. Um, this also has a phi in it, absolutely. Um, correct, yeah. If it, let's make it more complete. We, we could write a conditioning bar here, condition on xi. That's right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then same thing here. As we're sampling, this would be condition on xi. Great point. Yes? I, I might have missed something, but it's interesting that in the second term, I think the term that you removed was p theta of xi. <laughs> and mm -hmm. In the objective, you just add that term back in, but you're just estimating it. Is that, did I miss something, or is that, that's not, so technically, like the second objective had everything you needed. It had the Term, just not in the, um, yeah, that's that's a that's a good observation, and you'll see that come back later. That um, when we removed it, it was because we were just optimizing over phi, and there was no phi in it. But you're right; it was there. And if we were 
could optimize also over theta, then we could just have kept it. But um, yeah, I wouldn't worry about it for now, but it's a good observation. You'll see it come back later. Okay. Um, now, there is some theory in the IWA paper that shows that the more you sample your Zs, the more tight on expectation your bound will be. It's actually a bound and it becomes tighter and tighter as you get um, more samples. Now the trade-off is the more samples you get for your Zs, the more work you spend on those samples, the more work you do for effectively one gradient update, and so less gradient updates for the same compute budget. So it's a trade-off, how many do you really want in one pass? But let's say you have highly parallelizable compute infrastructure, then maybe you sample as much as you can do in parallel, put it all in there, and then you have a more accurate estimate than if you didn't do that. Okay, then skip these two. You can look at them offline if you want. Um, now let's look, take a look at a somewhat different way of getting to roughly the same idea. Um, and what I mean with that is that um, in the end, effectively, we'll end up with the same thing. Um, uh, if we only sampled once instead of k with this new derivation. Um, but it also turns out, and I think the new derivation is less intuitive. It's more like a derivation where like if you know the answer, then you can get to it quickly derivation rather than a very intuitive explanation. Um, but it is the one that people often use in papers and so forth because it's like a much shorter derivation to get where we want to be. And it is a correct derivation. But in the end, I think the intuition that we just build up is the right intuition and gets us where we need to be. But let's also derive it in the in the shorter version, I guess, um, right now. So let me, I think I actually have it on the next slide. And since we, we have a lot to cover, let me, let me just use it as written already. And so we can go through it just a little bit faster. Here is what we're trying to do again. So just to be clear, we're solving the exact same problem we've been solving so far, which we actually solved. We're done in some sense, except that most papers you're going to read are not going to derive it in that intuitive way, at least I think more, much more intuitive way. They're going to derive it this way. Um, OK, so then we say, OK, if that's what we're interested in, and we know that it's really a sum over z of pz times p theta x given z. Then we multiply and divide by qz. No mention of important sample, but obviously there's a strong connection there. It's, it's the same idea. Um, I'm going to go through it first before I get to your questions. Oh, zoom in. OK. How about this way? Oh, great. Yeah, much better. I agree. Much, much better. <laughs> Nice. Um, so it's no coincidence there is a multiply and divide by QZ, but in this derivation, it just comes as a random trick. Um, then you expand it um, and you use a bound to do the next step. So what you have here, sum over Z, QZ at the top, that's an expectation with respect to QZ. Um, we have a log up front. When you have a log of an expectation, you can't simplify things. Um, you want to bring the log on the inside to simplify. All those things multiplied together will become a sum, will simplify things. We want to swap the order of the log and the expectation. So what do we do? We apply Jensen's inequality, which says that the log of the expected value of x is bigger than the expected value of the log of x. I'll show that to you by example. So by example, I'm going to say I have two x's. I have x1 and an x2. And so I have correspondingly log x1 and log x2. And on the left here, I have the log of the expectation. Let's say it's an equal distribution, half weight on x1, half weight on x2. And the expected value of x is right in the middle. It's going to be right here. 
That's my EX, okay? I can look at the log, lands right there. That's this side. Now, for the other side, expected value of the log of x, half the weight is on this, half the weight on that. We gotta average that. Pictorially averaging that means we draw the line and take the point in the middle. And we see the green point in the middle lies below the red point that's above it, um, which shows indeed that the green side is lower than the left side, the red. Um, that's chances inequality. It's a bit more general than what I just showed here, but that's the main idea and how it's used almost all the time. Log of an expected value bigger than expected value of the log. By the way, it's equality if what's on the inside is constant, which will matter at some point in the future. So um, if we keep the thing on the inside constant, it's with equality, but if we don't keep it constant, it's an inequality. So you see here, we introduce that inequality and we end up with this over here now. This is actually the exact same thing we had earlier. It's what we're optimizing, is the expected value with respect to sampling from Q. Um, we have the distribution for Z here. That's the correction factor effectively coming into play. Um, we have the Z given XI. Um, so the, these two are the correction factor, right? That's the ratio, P over Q, that's the ratio right there. And then this is the other term. Um, so what you have here circled in green is the objective that is typically described as what you optimize to maximize the likelihood of your data under this latent variable model. Now, as I said, if we can achieve equality, meaning constant behind the log, um, then we have then we have the tightest bound because instead of bigger than equal, it's equal. So what we need to do this Q here is our thing that we get to choose. It's a free choice what our Q is, just like it was before. Q Z given X is a distribution that we get to choose. And so we're going to add an additional maximization on the inside here to maximize our choice for Q phi of Z. Given we can choose anything for it. The best choice, I guess, will get us the closest to, to the bound. And in fact, if we're expressive enough with our Q phi, we'll get all the way to equality. In fact, if Q phi, if we happen to choose Q phi Z given Xi proportional to the actual or equal to the actual PZ given Xi, we have equality and it's a tight bound. Why do we care about that? Well, we started with the idea that we want to maximize this log probability, we found something that lower bounds it, that's below it. So if we also maximize that, we're pushing it up against the thing we actually care about, and then we optimize the thing we care about more precisely. So I think there's a bit of a less intuitive derivation. It's more like some, some magic going on is one way to think of it, but it gives us effectively the same result as we have with the importance weighted um, derivation. There's yet a third derivation of the variational lower bound, which will give us yet some additional insight in it. So we're going to see a third way to get to the same result. We're not doing any new problems. Um, we just start from the KL. You say, I want to minimize the KL between Q, um, QZ and PZ given X. Remember that we wanted our QZ to be as close as possible to PZ given X. We had a bit more notation here. We called this Q. This, this was P theta Z given X. And this here we actually called um, Q phi Z given X. Um, but then, and I guess in this derivation, it was shortcut a little bit. Write out the KL divergence. It's an expectation of the log probability ratios. Um, PZ given X is the joint divided by the marginal. Just write it out. Then this last term, happened earlier also, and we got a comment on that, and it's coming back here. This last term here um, doesn't depend on z, so what that means, you have an expectation over z of something that is a constant with respect to z, that'll just be that constant, because the expectation of a constant is just a constant, because you integrate to one for a proper distribution here for z. 
So this stays on the outside. Um, and then they say, oh, wow, this is cool. What if we now rewrite this and bring log px to one side and we put everything else on the other side? Okay? And what you see now, and I'll add a bit of notation. As the way we had it was a p theta here. This would have pz, p theta x given z. This we, we would have been writing as q phi z given x. And this would be p theta z given x. And I'll write this as q phi z given x. So matching our previous notation here, what we see is that we have the same objective that we used to have in both derivations from before. In the first derivation, we said we also need to minimize this KL. In the second derivation, we said to make the bound as tight as possible, we got to minimize this KL, bring Q phi as close as possible to P theta as you given X. What we see here is in some sense what exactly it all means. We see that if we're optimizing log P theta given X, we can just optimize this entire thing. The first three terms are the things we've been working with or optimizing for theta. And then the second part is what we've been working with to optimize for phi. And we can see exactly when our bound isn't holding with equality, why it's not, is because the KL is not zero yet between Q phi and P theta for Z given X. So in some sense, this is the most comprehensive derivation because it tells you exactly what, you know, how close you are in optimizing P theta given X and where you might lose some precision in doing so. Namely, you would lose it in not having a zero KL here, which typically would be the case, by the way. It's very hard to drive that to exactly zero because your Q phi will also have some regularization, will be a neural network, it's function approximation, um, which has its benefits, uh, which means that you don't optimize the exact likelihood. Now, this is even the most magical derivation, right? Because you just start from the KL, you're not even talking about optimizing your P theta of X, and then all of a sudden you like swap some things around and you say, this is it. Um, but this is nice. If you write a paper, you just say, okay, well, this is what we do, and you have exactly what you want on paper there. And as you said earlier, yeah, if we, you know, if we don't throw this part out, which we did earlier, things just all end up in one optimization problem, and you're exactly right. Okay, so multiple derivations of the same thing. Um, how do we now optimize this? For the KL, um, effectively we sample from Q um, to then, um, well, let's, let's move to here. This is the thing we optimize. This expectation means we sample. So we will sample from Q to get some Zs for each X, uh, maybe just one Z. In fact, I think that's most often what's done. You sample just one Z for each X, because that's faster. And in the next round, you sample a new Z for that same X and you keep repeating. And then you can um, optimize this first part with respect to theta. And then you can optimize the second part with respect to phi. Um, okay. So, now, what I haven't told you yet is how we optimize these different terms. And there is really two different ways to do it. Um, let's start with the likelihood ratio gradient. So there's two ways to take derivatives through those objectives, the likelihood ratio gradient and the reparameterization trick. Usually you're gonna to wanna to use the reparameterization trick, but it's not as general as the likelihood ratio gradient. So we'll look at both. Um, so let, let's see if I actually have the derivation here because it's just a lot of math to write out. Well, this is not very high resolution, is it? Um, yeah, let me just rewrite it. So we're looking to maximize, let's say over phi, parameterization of our distribution, the expected value when we sample z from let's say Q phi of Z. We know that in our case, it's gonna be a Q phi of Z given X, but for this here, we just forget about the X, just to shorten the notation just a little bit. And it's an expected value of F of Z. 
you might say, okay, why don't we sample some z's, right? We'll have some zi coming from q phi of z, and then we take the gradient with respect to phi of 1 over k, i equal 1 through k, f of zi. I mean, that's what we do with expectation. We try to optimize through an expectation. We just sample and then take the gradient. Well, doesn't work here. Why does it not work here? Well, look at this gradient that we're computing here. The phi isn't in there. We're trying to optimize for the right phi, but the phi has just disappeared. Because the phi lives in the distribution we sample from. Q phi is what we sample from. We sampled from it, and then we say now this expectation over, you know, expected value f of z, let's optimize our phi, and it's gone. So this gradient will actually be zero, but it doesn't mean we have the right phi. It just means we made a mistake, a mathematical mistake, right? We, we can't do what we just did. This is not the way to go. So, what can we do? Let's take a look at what this actually means, right? We're maximizing over phi. Again, in practice, we can't enumerate all these, but you know, when we write out the math, we can pretend we can q phi of z, f of z. If I want to take the gradient of this with respect to phi, this thing, then I end up with sum over z, gradient respect to phi, q phi of z times f of z. Now I have my q phi there, I'm taking the gradient of it, it's, it's all looking good. Only thing I'm now not happy with is I have a sum over all z's, and it could be a lot of z's, and effectively what this says is, um, if I want to approximate this, the only, the only way to approximate this is essentially say, I'm going to um, have to uniformly sample over all z, which is probably a pretty bad way to sample because some z's are more important than other z's. So we're going to do the same thing again. I'm going to say, okay, this is the same as qz over, well, um, it's the same. In this case, I'm going to use the same one. We don't have to use the same one, actually. But in this case, it just happens to be that people tend to use the same one. Um, times f of z. Then, now I have an expectation of z sampled from q phi z of grad phi q phi z over q phi z times fc, which is often then rewritten as expectation z from q phi c grad phi log q phi of z times f of z. If you do reinforced learning, you see this a lot. The q will be a pi, um, but it's the same idea. So what I have now is an expectation which I could approximate with sampling. I could sample my z's from q phi, right? Z, I'm going to have my zi come from q phi of z, and then I have my approximation of 1 over k, i equal 1 through k, um, of grad respect to phi log q phi zi times f of zi. So now I'm doing it correctly. This is a clean way of computing gradients. You might say, well, how easy to get that grad log q phi z i? We choose our q phi of z to be something we can easily represent. Typically, q phi of z will be a q phi of z given x in our case, so it'll be x mapping through a neural network onto a distribution for z that's easy to work with. So all these terms are easy to work with, and we can optimize. So we're in good shape at this point, which is nice. Um, so this became our objective in the simple scenario of essentially optimizing a function of this type, which is exactly the type of function we were running into as we had concluded our derivation of the importance weighted version as well as the variational lower bound version. Okay, that's the low resolution version, the same thing. 
So what does it look like? Uh, as a very simple example, I'm going to try to apply this likelihood ratio gradient on a toy problem where I say my distribution that I'm trying to model has an unknown mean, mu, unit variance, so identity, well, once on the diagonal matrix for the, for the variance, and my objective, so I said I'm using x here rather than c, but this is the objective f of x. So what does that mean? I'm, what I'm trying to do is try to find a distribution that, um, and I guess we're minimizing here probably to make it more interesting, we're minimizing this objective. Um, what that means is that we're trying to position um, this Gaussian right onto the 5, 5 point. If I put it right on the 5, 5 point, then I'm minimizing the average deviation of my samples x from the 5, 5 point. We can read off the solution. Obviously, you could say, okay, I know the solution is 5, 5, but the exercise we're going through here is if I run the likelihood ratio policy, not policy, likelihood ratio gradient, what happens? Well, what do I have to do? I have to sample from my current distribution, and then I have to apply Resize. Then I have to apply this gradient step over here, right? Let's interpret that gradient step just a little bit. What is that gradient step saying? It's saying, I look at the grad log probability of a sample, okay? And I'm trying to increase, in this, let's say I'm trying to increase the grad log probability of a sample if it has a high score, if it's a sample that I like. So samples that are good samples, we try to bring up the probability, and samples that are bad samples, maybe negative scoring samples, you try to bring down the probability. So that's what's gonna be happening. So we start, we sa sample in the middle here, sample a bunch of stuff, um, take a step, we end up over there. We sample some more stuff, we end up over there, we're going to keep going around, and it kind of makes pretty slow progress to get to the target. What, why is that? Because as you sample, the best they can really do, and this is through many steps, is kind of shift towards your best samples. And none of your best samples were actually at the target. And so unless you have a sample that lands right on the target, you're not going to land on the target. Nothing in this gradient tells you to go to the target. It just tells you whichever samples look best, go closer to those and keep repeating that. And so it's a very gradual optimization. It doesn't have as much signal as you would be hoping for. But it's something you can always do. But it might feel pretty unsatisfactory that this is uh, what you can always do, but then doesn't work super well. Um, here is an alternative. Remember, um, we're trying to optimize this parameter phi of a distribution over z such that we're optimizing f of z. And now I'm going to make a very specific choice, by the way. And we're going to do this by example, but it is more general than this example. I'm going to say q phi of z is a Gaussian with mean mu and variance sigma squared. What that means, and this is what is called the reparameterization trick, is that instead of sampling from this Gaussian as something that's some abstract thing that's happening, I can make it more concrete because I know what I'm doing here. And I can say, when I create a sample, what I'm really doing is I'm creating a z which is equal to mu plus epsilon times sigma. This is 1D, just to keep things simple. Of course, you can do the math higher dimensional, but I'm trying to get at the core of the reparameterization trick where epsilon comes from normal year one, okay? It's just a way to sample from a Gaussian is to do it by sampling from a unit Gaussian and then add the mean and also scale the sample with the standard deviation. Okay, now if I go back to what we're trying to do, we're trying to optimize now an expectation, which was over C, but really is well, I'll also write the original. So it's z coming from normal mu sigma squared f of z. 
But really what we now know is this is an expansion of epsilon coming from a normal zero one of f mu plus epsilon times sigma. Okay, now remember that earlier we said we have an expectation, let's just sample and then take the gradient and it just made the parameters disappear and it was a broken way to do it. Now it's not a problem because the parameters do not appear in the sampling process. The reason it was broken because the parameters that we try to optimize were in the sampling process. We first sample and then optimize the parameters, it's too late. But now the parameters are in the objective here. They're not in the sampling process anymore. So now we can sample. We can say this is approximately equal to 1 over k i from 1 through k of f mu plus epsilon i times times sigma, where epsilon i come from a unit Gaussian. We can directly optimize this for mu and or mu and sigma, no problem. We did not hide anything. The sampling process did not have the parameters in it, so we can directly optimize this over here. Going back to our example, right? Um, in our example, f was really something along the lines of um, we want to be close to 5, so it would have been 1 over k, i equal 1 through k, and f was, I want to be as close as possible to 5, so it would be mu plus epsilon i times sigma minus 5. It was 2d, but let's ignore that for now. If you look at this objective here, what you're really seeing is that you're going to push mu to 5 pretty quickly. Sure, there's a little bit of noise in it because of the epsilon i's, but there's a lot of signals saying that your mu should go to 5, and if that's really the objective, your sigma should go to 0, actually. Now, maybe that's not the objective you really want because it collapses everything, but the signal is very prominent, and the optimization will go so much faster than with the likelihood ratio uh, gradients. Same thing. Um, now, you might have said, hey, you're using a Gaussian. It's pretty limiting. Well, Two counterpoints to that. One counterpoint, because the derivation definitely uses a Gaussian here, right? This reparameterization. There are other distributions that lend themselves to the same trick. And in fact, um, when we look at flow models, last lecture, essentially what is a flow model? It's a reparameterization trick, effectively. So you could put any kind of flow there, and that's OK, because the gradient can go right through. So that's one thing to consider. The other thing to consider is that even though you might say Gaussian it's limiting, remember why do we even have a Gaussian there? It's to land in a simple space. We want to go from a complex X space to a simple Z space. And maybe the fact that we put a Gaussian there is a positive rather than a negative to end up with a good simpler representation of our data. Um, so two reasons why is actually much more general than it might seem at first. And it is also what's uh, very often used in Today's most popular versions use some quantization tricks on top of this that make it more robust, more sharp in some sense, the images you get out. But it's kind of the same idea, reparameterization trick going through the quantization step. I think Kevin will probably say something about it later when looking at the vector quantized VAE. So, Well, this is just, a, I guess, a, a typeset version of what we looked at. It's saying that if we're trying to optimize an expectation respect to a Gaussian, um, and we're optimizing the parameters of the Gaussian, we can um, convert it into a unit Gaussian uh, with respect to which we take the expectation and then have a direct optimization of the parameters of the Gaussian. So let's go back to our toy problem. We want this thing to go to 5.5. Five. Um, with a pathwise derivative, essentially, we're just like moving the right direction step by step. This, of course, depends on the step size of our gradient updates, but we don't hop around. It's not like, where did my most lucky sample end up landing? Let's move over there, and then where's my now most lucky sample? Let's move over there. It's actually seeing the gradient towards where the mean is supposed to be and keeps moving directly in that direction. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, let's, 
Let's go back to what we had, right? We had our frictional autoencoder equation, which consisted of um, the terms, well, we were maximizing over theta and phi, and we had the variational lower bound, which is this thing over here that we're optimizing, um, which is an expectation with respect to Q phi, we're sampling our Zs. Um, we now have a choice. Do we apply the likelihood ratio gradient or do we apply the reparameterization trick gradient? We know that it depends on what distribution our Q phi is. If it's a Gaussian, we can apply the reparameterization trick. If it's a binary distribution like binomial, we can't apply it. There is no reparameterization trick for that. We might have to use the likelihood ratio gradient. So let's look at the likelihood ratio gradient first. What does it end up looking as? Um, it really pops up over here as we're optimizing this phi um, for our variational distribution Q. Um, it's essentially this slide, I mean, I think we, we have so much to cover that we can maybe go through the details after lecture who wants to on their own, but essentially what we're doing is we're applying that same idea of um, likelihood ratio gradient now to this specific objective. Um, as you work through it, what do you end up with? Um, you end up with this part over here. Question? Oh. Um, end up with this part over here. You sample. You have a uh, grad log probability of z given xi, which then gets multiplied into your objective. Um, so it's, and the objective here is this, this part on the top here. So, and then the second part, which on the slide is saying, actually, if you work out the math, it kind of disappears. It, it kind of cancels out to a gradient of zero. So you can work, you, you can essentially just sample your Zs, look at the grad log probability with respect to Q, and then multiply it with the objective to get um, your optimization problem for phi. And then your optimization problem for theta is very simple. You have your samples from Q phi, and you just maximize log probability of x with respect to given z. So that's one way to do it. Um, it's general. The way it's usually done um, is using the pathwise um, derivation. Let's skip these slides. Um, and so in this case, the variational lower bound essentially comes down to that you will see sampling from a unit Gaussian uh, instead of from some arbitrary Q. The parameters will be worked into the objective, and you get one big objective that you optimize as you're trying to uh, compute the best phi's and q's. Let's see. Um, yeah, let's give some examples and then take a, take a break. Um, so, your q phi z given x will now typically be a essentially a neural network will be under the hood that goes from x to the mu and the sigma phi. Um, and then in the other direction, there is your p theta x given z. The reason it's called an autoencoder is because essentially you turn your x into a z and then get back out x. And that's what autoencoders refer to, um, is that you somehow ideally compress your data and then recover it back out. There's other ones like denoising autoencoders where you um, put noise along the way um, very in very specific ways, or maybe even on the X you put noise. This one can also be thought of as actually putting noise on, on your um, embedding, because really what happens if you look at the details as you go from X to Z, usually it's designed in the simplest cases to be a deterministic mapping from X to mu and sigma, but then your z is sampled from this distribution. So really what's happening is you get a mu and sigma, and because you sample your z, there's a little bit of noise. You're not exactly landing on mu, you're landing somewhere around there. And then you have to decode back onto x. And you can say, well, that's annoying that the noise pops up there, but at least my intuition is that's actually a feature. Because that noise is actually ensuring that in the embedding, embedding space z, if you move around just a little bit there, the result x should remain the same. You can't have a totally different x when you just move a little bit, because then you would never recover the correct x during training. 
And so another way that just discards all these derivations to think of the VAE, I'm not saying it's the right way. The nice thing about derivations is that you have an objective. You know that when the you know, objective is being optimized, you're doing better and better and better. There's compression tied to it. But if you want to just be like super simple and intuitive about it, you say, I have a neural network. Let me erase everything for a second. If you want to be maximally simple about it, you just say I have a neural network that goes from X to Z. Then I put noise in Z space, a little bit of you know, noise in Z space, and then have to be able to recover X still. And the reason I like it is because it means that my embeddings have to be such that nearby embeddings must have a similar meaning in X space, otherwise I couldn't do this back and forth this way. And that's it. That's, that's another way to get to VAE um, without any of the formal derivations. Then the question becomes, well, you know, if that's the only intuition you have, well, are you really optimizing an objective? What are you doing? Like, how do you measure the errors on X and so forth? And if you run your optimization, do you know you're improving on an objective? If you don't know that, then it's hard to debug things. So that's why it's nice to have all the formalities because you know that your optimization is correctly set up. But probably the highest level intuition of why these embeddings are good and meaningful is just that. Embed, put noise, and you got to recover the original so locally things cannot change much. If you change your embedding space locally, things cannot change much in X space. VAE at the time when the paper came out, it's a while ago now, it must have been 2013 or 14 something, um, was compared with the wake sleep algorithm, which was the best algorithm at the time, is not popular at all these days, uh, and was outperforming it, which made, made it a big deal that it was possible to outperform it. Um, you see here consistently the red curves doing better than the green curves um, on some you know, simple data sets at the time, MNIST and some simple face data sets. Um, MNIST digit generation with the VAE at the time, this was a big deal. This is not today's age where we can create any kind of deep fakes that we want. This was like, wow, you can actually generate images that look like handwritten digits by just sampling uh, from this VAE. And the interpolations are nice. You pick, you know, a few extremes and you interpolate in latent space and you see that you get, you know, a nice, nice progression between the different kinds of digits. I'll skip this. Oh, well, I'll briefly say something here. At the time it came out, the VAE did not get the same um, likelihood scores as an autoaggressive model. Autoaggressive models are in some sense more focused on maximizing the log probability and tend to score a bit better at it. But then the VAEs have to do this work to put things into a latent space where the noise is introduced. So there's kind of more work for them to do, which might lead to better representations, but doesn't always give the same uh, great uh, likelihood scores or bits per dim type scores. Um, but it gets close. Um, we talked about, you know, why is the autoencoder? There's a reconstruction loss to go from Z back to X. And it was then the regularization to keep your distribution for Z close to a prior that you imposed for Z um, that uh, ensures that you have a nice... Yeah, I think Peter gave a, a nice kind of motivation for why the VAE exists and different ways you can arrive at it. Um, the second part of the lecture will be mis mostly variations on, on the simple VAE, so we'll go over a bit how this looks like um, implementation-wise or like practically speaking, uh, and then go on to, to discuss different options we can do to treat different uh, parts of the VAE. Um, so maybe one thing we can do first is just kind of go over from a, from like a systems point of view what a, what a VAE looks like. So at the top is what we do during training. So X here is kind of the data distribution. So it's your, your set of images, for example. Uh, and we're trying to discover this, this latent variable Z uh, that kind of correlates to this image. So there, there are kind of multiple motivations for, for why people use VAEs in practice. One of them is if you just want a generative model. So if we want a generative model, it's saying we want to just be able to generate basically new images from nothing that fit the distribution. Um, another kind of motivation is sometimes you, you just care about Z. So sometimes we like having a latent variable that represents an image uh, is nice because you can condition another neural network on it. Or you can do some manipulations uh, in Z space that then transfer to manipulation in image space. So there's kind of two, two main components of the VAE, which is using it as a generative model and also uh, as a representation learning tool. Uh, and the derivations that we went over in the first half of the lecture 
uh, end up leaving us with these two losses over here. Let's see if I can write, yes. Okay, so we have the, the reconstruction loss, which is basically uh, maximizing uh, the log probability of the data uh, um, with using Zs that are not uh, actually generated from, from uh, the, the true prior, but this uh, approximation Q. So because we're using an approximation uh, Q of Z given X instead of the real uh, P of Z given X, we also have this regularization term, uh, which basically says, just make sure that Q of Z given X uh, is, is close to what you would get if you uh, applied Bayes' rule to the real P. And of course, as we, as we saw before, the real P is intractable. We can't sample from it. So we use uh, this approximation instead. So the idea is, yeah, you, you can train here on images from your, from your data set, or I mean, not just images, other things as well, uh, optimizing these two objectives. So once we have this, if we want to sample from this model, uh, we can just discard the encoder. So during sampling time, we don't know what our images look like. Right? We want to generate new ones. Uh, so intuitively, that's saying, OK, well, we don't need this first part here. We're just going to sample Zs uh, from our prior distribution. Uh, and in the, in the derivations before, we used uh, the unit Gaussian. So this is basically saying, during training, we, we sample Zs from, from this, which uh, is not really the unit Gaussian. It's actually just um, Zs that are likely to come from X. Uh, but we have this regularization term, so Q is like the unit Gaussian. Okay, and during sampling time, we, we substitute in the true unit Gaussian here uh, and try to generate samples from them. So kind of a high level, this is how you train a VAE. This is how you would use it during sampling. Uh, and we can use this, and it, it kind of works on, in, a, in a bunch of different ways. Um, so this is some results generating uh, faces from a VAE. Uh, and it's kind of nice. So these are all random faces that kind of look like faces from the data set, but aren't actually from there. Uh, and kind of a, a cheap way, which we, we haven't shown here, to, to verify if it's memorizing or not, is to look up uh, the nearest neighbor in the data set. So something you can do as a sanity check, this might be helpful, is uh, look up. Like take one, take a sample, and just try to find the closest sample in the data set. If they match exactly, you're doing something wrong. Uh, it's just memorizing or it's uh, overfitting. Uh, but if these images kind of look natural, but there's not exact clones, uh, then, then that's on the right track. And, and you'll notice that VAEs work pretty well in, in settings where uh, the images follow some sort of form. So in all these faces, there's kind of, uh, the faces rotate, they move around, but all the eyes are centered. Uh, in the same place. And, and that's kind of coming from the fact that well, you have to represent a face in this, in this case in like, a, for example, a 16-dimensional latent vector. There's not much info you can get there. Uh, in fact, because we assume the latent vector is a Gaussian, uh, all the dimensions are independent, uh, which even limits even more the kind of info that you can, you can represent in your space. Uh, but, then, but the nice thing about this Gaussian inter interpretation is we can do uh, interpolation. Uh, this, this was supposed to be a video that didn't really work. Uh, but as you saw in the MNIST slides earlier, you can basically take one image generated from a VAE and, and smoothly uh, interpolate it until it looks like a different image. Uh, and the reason this works is because the images are represented as points sampled from the unit Gaussian. And we know that you know, in a unit Gaussian distribution, uh, there's kind of high probability mass between any linear combination of points. They stay within the kind of high probability regions. So uh, if you take any two points in z-space and linearly interpolate, um, you can be confident you're still within the support. Just curious, does it matter whether you follow, in some sense, the, the curvature, meaning interpolate on a sphere, surface of a sphere, versus in keeping the norm constant? Or um, just go right yeah, through it? There might be some empirical reasons why. So in, in theory, it, it shouldn't matter because um, Basically, and any convex combination of points within the unit Gaussian will um, stay within the, I guess the, the, the least probable point is the least lower, the least probable point you'll encounter on the path. So at least uh, your z space will remain within kind of the high log likelihood space. Uh, so, but there might be some, some kind of numerical reasons why that's true, I don't know. Uh, so this is come, some nice things we get from the unit Gaussian. So the unit Gaussian has a lot of nice properties, uh, but it turns out we can use, we can use different things. Uh, and the fact here is like PZ is, is this prior design choice. So we, we derive the whole VAE using a generic prior, and we kind of assume that, uh, well, let's use the unit Gaussian. It has a lot of nice properties, uh, but we can experiment with different ideas. And a lot of the 
extensions on, on uh, how VAEs work today uh, use different choices on what PFZ can be. So first, let, let's kind of think about why we use the, the unit Gaussian or, or the unit normal here. Well, one thing is there's this nice analytic form, and uh, it's very easy to compute the KL divergence between uh, two Gaussians. Well, we, we can take this without sampling. We can calculate, essentially. It's a term involving the mean and the, the log standard deviation. Um, and yeah, as, as I said before, we can do these nice linear interpolations uh, because the space is kind of well behaved. So points within that space are, points that are close within the space generally are, are close uh, in the output distribution. Uh, but we have this, this one downside, which is the dimensions are all independent. So when I'm sampling Zs from the unit Gaussian, the, the sample on the second dimension does not depend on the first, uh, which means that, for example, if I'm sampling a face, and I know my, this first dimension tells me my face is, is turned. The second dimension, maybe it corresponds to, to ears, but one of the ears is hidden. Uh, you're gonna have weird behavior if you sample you know, a certain kind of ear when the face is turned. So, so you don't get to take into account uh, prior other dimensions, which is kind of something unsatisfying about the unit norm. Uh, and so this introduces, um, this, this NVAE paper basically builds on these idea of hierarchical VAEs where the idea is we can actually learn more expressive distributions uh, of P of Z. And in this case, what we want to do is we want to learn two networks, actually. We want to learn uh, P of Z, and we want to learn this Q of uh, Z given X. And we want those distributions to be close uh, in KL so that when we sample from uh, P of Z, it's, it's equivalent to sampling from, from Q of Z given X. But it's actually, uh, the, the form of these two distributions can be up in the air. They can be essentially uh, chosen to be whatever we want uh, as long as the KL divergence between them is slow. So one option to do this is, well, we can sample Z's autoregressive. So imagine our prior distribution is actually a neural network uh, where we first uh, sample Z of one, maybe from a, from a Gaussian, and then we sample Z2 conditioned on Z1 and Z3 conditioned on everything before. And so this is kind of what we talked about in, in the lecture two on, on autoregressive models. Uh, and so how do we do this? Well, we can still use the, the Gaussian. We just use the, un, we just use the Gaussian where the, the mean and standard deviation are conditioned uh, on the sample of the previous dimension. Uh, it turns out that there's some certain instabilities that come if you just do this naively. So if we just have uh, two autoregressive models, one for P and one for Q, uh, even though we enforce that KL uh, similar, um, actually getting that KL loss to, uh, to converge is quite tricky. So in practice, uh, we use this residual normal, which is uh, a trick from this NVA. So the idea of the residual normal is, well, we can define a normal distribution as uh, a normal distribution on top of, an, of another normal distribution. So you sample you know, one thing from distribution one, and then you sample another normal uh, on top of that, so using the output of that as the mean. Uh, and so what we do here is we have our prior defined by P. So our prior defines this sort of distribution here. Uh, and then Q is defined as a residual on top of that. So basically you take, take the mean uh, outputted here from, from here uh, and add this delta term. And we take the standard deviation and uh, for standard deviation you multiply the delta term. Uh, and then the nice thing about this is we get, we get back this, this analytic KL divergence again. So one of the nice things about using the Gaussian is we have this, this we can calculate the KL over the entire distribution uh, without sampling it because we know the form. Well, if you define these things as residuals, uh, we get this back again. Uh, and then kind of one insight here is that uh, the residual normal. Any comments on what's the problem with not doing the residual? Yeah, the problem with not doing the residual is that, and this is explained a bit more in the papers, uh, if these distributions are kind of wildly different, so if, if if this distribution has like a you know a mu of, of five, and here we have mu of negative five, uh, then the gradient between these two becomes really uh, numerically unstable. So the kind of the KL between these two becomes very high, uh, and it, that leads to basically bad numerical properties. So it, it's nice if uh, if both of these distributions kind of look close to each other. 
Delta? Yeah, so kind of one way to look at this is, let's say the, I, I've already sampled Z1, so Z1 is, is some, some value, some real number, say 0.5. Then now what I want to do is P of Z2 given Z1, which we're defining as kind of this normal variable where let's say the mean is, is 1 and the standard deviation is, is also 1. Uh, but now what I want to do is kind of define z2 given z1 and x, where x is, is the image. So one way to do it is to try and match, match this distribution by also outputting this. Uh, but the other way to do it is to output just the like 1 plus something and 1 times something here. That's basically just saying like the, 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 it's like the distribution with with knowledge of the, the underlying image, it's just a, a kind of transformation over the prior distribution. Uh, and, and this is a generalization of if your P of if your prior distribution P here is just uh, the normal uh, with mu zero of standard deviation one, um, then this is actually just a generalization of the, of the original VAE term. So your delta terms just become the regular mean and standard deviation. Um, so this is one way to do, to add a more powerful prior. So in this case, P of Z, given uh, the previous Z's are R learn. So during sampling time, uh, you would not sample your entire like uh, latent dimension, latent variable at once, but you would use this autoregressive sampling to sample one dimension at a time, uh, and then you would decode your image from there. Uh, so okay, what else can we do for our prior distributions? Well, one answer is that we've been, we've been looking mostly at continuous distributions, uh, which kind of makes sense because we can define flows on them. We can kind of, uh, they have some nice properties. Uh, but there are also nice properties that come with discrete distributions. And one of the most powerful ones is uh, it's very easy to, to define expressive distributions as, as categorical. Um, in continuous space, we usually use uh, the Gaussian distribution but it's hard to define, for example, a Gaussian distribution with, with two modes. Or two. Um, whereas in discrete space, we can do all sorts of fancy things because we don't have to worry too much about um, defining the entire space. Uh, and the other nice thing is, is the, the capacity of Z is bounded. Uh, I'll explain a little bit more about what this means, but it basically means uh, even if we don't know the, the, the actual form of PZ, we can, we can kind of get a bound on this KL term. So we can know at least uh, in the worst case how, how much off we are. So that, that introduces VQVAE. Uh, this is a, a model that you'll hear a lot uh, if, you, if you read recent papers. It's, it's proven to be quite powerful. Uh, and the original paper is it's not exactly a VAE, so. Sorry to jump in. Can you go back for a moment? Yeah. One more. I wonder if part of the rationale here is, you, although you want to sample from PZ mm -hmm. right, to generate new samples, and then by training this way, you have maximum parameter sharing yeah. between the Z given X and just Z given Z. Right. They're, they're like, so there's the higher chance that I guess you, you learn the right thing mm -hmm. rather than you require to train two separate things. Yeah. Yeah, so, so what Peter's saying here is if we define um, Q just as a, as a residual over P, well then like naturally we're kind of training both of the networks at the same time uh, if P is outputting a correct uh, autoregressive distribution. So during sampling time, we discard Q. So it kind of doesn't make sense for Q ha having to model P and additional stuff, whereas if we can say P is, or Q is kind of additional information, you know, using the output of P, uh, we can kind of use P during training time and, and share that, that, that compute. Uh, yeah, so back to VQVAE. So this is, this is kind of a, a model of, of how the architecture works. And, and the caveat here is, yeah, it's not exactly a VAE, so we'll, we'll, we'll kind of glance over the, the KL loss part. So for this first part, just focus mostly on this, uh, on this reconstruction loss here. So let's focus on, yeah, on this part here. And this KL part, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but the basic intuition between the VQAV is, what if we have 
z instead of being continuous vector be a, a set of, of code words. So here we, we learn this, we have this matrix here of let's say uh, k different words, or k different code words, where a code word is just a vector, uh, and then the dimension here is, is maybe d. Uh, the idea is to map from your input image to a set of code words uh, that then decode into that image. So normally, we don't just have one code word. We would have, for example, a, uh, we would have like this matrix. Uh, let's say a 32 by 32 image would map to, let's say, a 4 by 4 matrix of, of code words with one matrix or one word in, in each square. Uh, and then, and the idea is, if you map your image into these discrete tokens, it's kind of naturally the the you you kind of naturally learn this compressed form of the image because uh, in a continuous space you can kind of model arbitrary amounts of info. Here we're kind of enforcing that the the information in the image needs to be limited to this this combination of tokens. Uh, and so if we can recreate the image uh, from those tokens, we know that they're they're learning something correct. How do you choose on the value of k for your problem? Is there like any way to find maybe a minimum? Uh, so k is largely a hyperparameter. I think I, I don't know off the top of my head if there are some like justified ways to choose k. I think kind of a empirical way to choose k is the larger your k gets, probably the the better you'll be able to recreate your image. Um, but at some point, your your samples from when you're trying to sample from this distribution will get worse. So you can imagine at the case where k is at infinity, uh, it becomes very hard to to sample images that actually. Uh, fit the so the, the the prior, so there's kind of this trade-off between if k is really high, well it's easy to get high log likelihoods, uh, but your your kind of KL divergence between your prior and, and what you sample for will get will get higher. So what does uh, yeah this is kind of just some more some more intuition on what the VQV is doing. How does our VA look if we if we interpret it as in the VQ version? Well, this distribution here becomes a, a deterministic distribution. So the way it works is, uh, let, let's talk about one case where we just pick uh, one vector for each image or one code book for each image, one yeah, one code word for each. Image. Uh, we would basically take our image compress it down into the latent space with the neural network and pick the code word that's the closest to the output of that network. Uh, and so you can kind of imagine this as a deterministic distribution where we assign a probability of 1 uh, to the vector that's the closest to the image and 0 to every other vector. Um, and that means that this kind of KL term, if we assume uh, a uniform distribution over the vectors as our prior, um, is kind of bounded by this, this log K term. So we can say some things about kind of how much our, our log probabilities match the true log probabilities based on the fact that, uh, that we're bounded by this uh, discrete space. Yeah, OK, I was, this slide got a little bit messed up. Um, maybe what I can do is I will just, I'll just write what, what this is saying here. But this, is, this, is kind of, this slide kind of answers a question of, how do you actually optimize through discrete space? So this is kind of. When you, when you first re look at these ideas, it's kind of unclear how to, how to handle the fact that we're tokenizing. Because you know, gradients are usually defined on continuous spaces. Um, how can we actually how can we do this uh, in, in a space that, that's discrete? So let me just write this term down here. So th there's kind of three terms that we have to use uh, in conjunction. In the normal VAE, we only have this term. Right? This is just the, the log likelihood of the data. So that's still there. Um, with the caveat that we use this kind of straight through optimization trick. So if you ever hear someone say we use the, the straight through trick or the straight through optimizer, um, what it means is when you take their image x, you'll first map it to some some predicted latent vector, let's say, I'll call it z prime. Uh, and then we'll find the closest code book, which is the closest code word that, that matches the z, which we'll call z. And then from this z, we'll then decode x prime. 
Uh, but there's a jump. These two z's are not exactly the same. So how do you handle this? Uh, it turns out in practice what you do is uh, you calculate the gradient with respect uh, to z, but then you uh, just transfer it over to, to z prime. And then in the homework, we'll, we'll show you basically exactly what this means in terms of uh, PyTorch code. It's actually very simple to do. Uh, but the basic idea is to just kind of assume that these vectors are very close together and take the gradient pretending one vector is up. Uh, and then these, these other two terms here just help this process work better. So this embedding loss here, um, SG here means the, the stop gradient operator. So in this case, we would take the, the gradient with respect to, to E here and ignore the gradient uh, with respect to Z here. Um, yeah, what this is saying here uh, is that, sorry, I know this, this is a little confusing. This is E here in this notation, and this is uh, Z of X. What this term is saying is, uh, for, I need to somehow optimize the codebook words to, to be close to what the what this encoder here is outputting. It's basically saying move this vector close to that. Uh, and then the commitment loss is basically saying, well, move this vector close to that. Uh, and there's, there's a term on this. There's some kind of way to balance it. Uh, in practice, this term doesn't matter too much. Uh, so I think th this kind of stuff is better understood implementing it. But the high level idea is, um, how do you optimize through the discrete operator? Uh, just take, just kind of assume that the, your discrete jump uh, is not very big, and have these two terms to penalize that jump for being big. Can I add a little bit of intuition? Mm -hmm. Yes. I think one other way, the way I like to think of it is that if you go from x to your z prime, as Kevin had, it's just an alternative way to think of it. In a standard autoencoder, you would then go from z prime, or a standard view, you would go to essentially this you can think of as your mu of x, right? Or your mu of x would really go to mu of x plus epsilon times sigma. That's what a standard VAE would do. And in this vector quantized VAE, the way you can think of it is essentially that you look at the surrounding means and the surrounding means that you get to choose from. So you look at you know one through k, and that determines your choice of epsilon. So instead of sampling epsilon from a normal, your epsilon becomes essentially, as I try to round onto a nearby thing, what am I, how much am I rounding? And that process tells you what your epsilon is. So, and once you think of it that way, you can, it's basically like a standard VAE, it's just, you don't sample the Gaussian to get the epsilon, you just do that process of where's my nearest neighbor, and that, that delta is my epsilon. And now I can infuse it the same way, and everything, everything works the same way. I mean, you still need to do the other two terms, but it's just another way to think about what's happening and why the gradients and just go through. Cool, yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, OK, so one kind of additional step you need to do in, in the VQVAE is when we're, um, when we're learning this kind of encoding from, from uh, x to z, the, this distribution of, of kind of this distribution Q of, of Z given X here, uh, it's not uniform, right? Some, some tokens will be used more than other tokens. Uh, and so if we try to sample from Q of Z given X uniformly, we're actually going to get samples that do not match the, the data distribution. Uh, what we need to do is we need to, to train our prior, a P of Z, uh, to match this kind of data condition prior of, of um, Q of Z given X, I guess, uh, you know, times p of x from, from the data. So it, it's kind of, uh, one way to think of this is kind of a, a reverse form of what we do uh, in a normal VAE. So in a normal VAE, we define our prior first, uh, and we make sure that this uh, encoder q of z given x matches our prior. Uh, in the VQ VAE, we kind of learn the encoder first, uh, and then after the fact, we learn our prior uh, to match what the encoder has learned. And the nice thing is that p of z here, we, we can again choose it to be anything we want. And so we can plug in our favorite generative model um, as this kind of prior learn. So in the original VQV and, and VQVA2 papers, they used uh, the Pixel CNN, which you worked on in homework one. 
Uh, and then these days, um, we tend to use models like a transformer or a, or a diffusion model, which we'll cover later, uh, over that Z space. Uh, but the basic idea here is, uh, first you learn your, your tokens. So you learn tokens that help kind of compress an image into the latent space, uh, and then learn a prior over the tokens. And often these two things are, are decoupled. So you can do one first, uh, and then the other. Uh, so yeah, here's some examples on VQVAE. Uh, and we can see like VQVAE was kind of a, a nice leap in performance from what we could do with the, the standard VAE. The images we generate here are a lot more like crisp and clear compared to when we had to map them onto the unit Gaussian. Part of that intuitively is that the, the unit Gaussian enforces this kind of smoothness uh, between the latent space and, and the images. Whereas in reality, images are actually, they have a lot of edges, they have a lot of harder transitions. Uh, and the discrete tokens kind of help um, model that. Um, yeah, so here's some more examples of uh, the VQVAE sampling images. Um, they're, they're still not perfect, and I think VQVAE models today are, are getting even better than this. So you can see, like, from a distance, they look good. Um, if you look closely enough, you'll realize some of the, some of the bodies don't look quite right. Uh, and, and part of that is the fact that our latent space in, in the VQVAE is still kind of uh, spatial. So relationships between different spatial areas of the image are still kind of disentangled, which is, which is nice in some ways. Like uh, usually the, the bottom corner is not as, the bottom corner still contains more information about its local neighbors than the top. Uh, but in cases where you have the body of an animal, actually you do need those spatial relationships and sometimes those things can get lost. So, yeah, VQVA 2.0 uh, is basically just the kind of the improvements over the original VQVA model. I, I think there's not too much in terms of of things we need to go over for this, other than the fact that this exists. So, if you're trying to implement VQVA, take a look at what they do in two, and usually the tricks here will will help improve your your training. Uh, but here are some here are some examples of things generated from, from VQVAE 2.0. Uh, the nice, so kind of one other nice thing about uh, these VQVAE models and, and specific models that decouple uh, your prior versus your uh, encoder-decoder is it's easier to do conditional generation. So in this case, these images are actually conditional on, the, on image net classes. So over here, we're trying to generate uh, ducks or, or dogs over here. Uh, and then the nice thing is we can learn our encoder and decoder in an unconditional way. Uh, and we only have to train our prior in a conditional way, which kind of, again, it decouples this process. So you can do a lot of heavy lifting, uh, mapping your raw pixel images to tokens, uh, and then you can just generate tokens uh, with a conditional prior. So the same way uh, in homework one, we did the, the text to, to image with the transformer, you can do that same sort of thing here where we're generating uh, tokens instead. Um, yeah, and then finally, one, one nice thing about the VAE, which we'll, I'll, I'll talk briefly about it here, I think we'll talk about it more in a, in a future lecture, is that they don't, su they don't suffer as much about this problem of, of mode coverage. So one, one thing you'll see, I think, in, in next week's lecture with, about GANs is that certain types of generative models tend to uh, collapse to certain modes. So, so one kind of way to think about this is if my image data set has 10 images, um, the VAE has to give a high probability to every single one of those images. Whereas other types of models, such as, such as the GAN, maybe it can give very high probabilities to half of them uh, and ignore the other half. Uh, which means that all your images will look good, but they won't be very diverse. You can see here that the GAN generated images all kind of share the same pose, uh, whereas the VAE images have things in, in a lot of different positions. So we will talk about this a little bit more, but one intuition about the VAE and, and likelihood-based models is that they do try to model exactly the, the data distribution. Um, yeah, here are some more examples of, of the diversity here. Um, yeah, again here you can see different zoomed-in forms, you can see different, different angles. Uh, uh, yeah, in comparison to over there, this is Big GAN, which is one of the state-of-the-art. GAN models. Uh, yeah, and then kind of one, one concluding comment here uh, is that 
largely VAEs have not changed too much since uh, in the last few years. I think advances have, have happened pretty dramatically in, in the other generative models. Um, but VAEs are still used pretty reliably as a building block for kind of other types of, of generative modeling. Uh, basically, a lot, a lot of the, the, the state-of-the-art image generation methods today still use a VAE to do that, that initial processing. So uh, the EQGAN, which we'll talk about next week, builds off the VQVAE. And then stable diffusion uses a VAE to, to map images to a latent space first, and then, we'll, and then tries to model that, that latent space first. Same with this um, cog view, which basically does uh, a text-to-image transformer on the latent space uh, where that space is first learned from the VAE. So one intuition to take away is you can use the VAE to just learn this really good mapping from X to Z, Z back to X. Uh, and then if you can model P of X, you kind of already have your model. Or if you can model P of Z, you already have your model for, for P of X. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the end of the, the variation setting. Since we have a little bit more time, we can talk about some kind of other ways to look at VAEs. One way is this kind of just this view of mutual information, which might be helpful. Um, so the mutual information between two variables is, is defined as this. So it's basically the entropy of uh, your x distribution minus the, the conditional entropy. Uh, and you can compute it either way. And if we're modeling data sets, usually this is fixed. So if, if you have x as a space of images, well, you're not going to change the, the entropy of your underlying data. It's, it's just there. But what we can do is we can, uh, we can improve this term. So we can improve. Uh, basically reduce the entropy of your data conditioned on, on some, some variable y. So y, you can think of y as, as z in the other case. That's kind of the relation here. Um, and, and mutual information is, is kind of a, does not use any form of, of linearity. So covariance is kind of one way to, to look at relations between two variables, but it, it depends a lot on basically the, the linear relationship between them. Um, and so in a lot of papers you might read, you'll refer to, um, or they'll, they'll mention mutual information, and they'll mention um, basically maximizing mutual information between one variable and another. And so the, the trick to understand is just VAEs are one way to, to do mutual information maximization. Um, and the explanation here is, um, so, so these actual entropies are, are intractable. Um, basically, this is saying like the, 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 the true mutual information between two variables is kind of the, the best case decoder. So if you had the optimal way to predict uh, x from z, or, or in this case, z from x, that's what your mutual information would be. Um, we don't know if our model is, is the best, so the best we can do is a, is, an, is a bound on it. So the best we can do is basically a bound saying, uh, if I can provide you an encoder that can predict x to this degree, I kind of have a, a certificate that the mutual information is at least that number, although the true one could be higher. Uh, and so kind of the derivation here should look very similar to what we saw before. Uh, basically, we can uh, encode z using, using p. So uh, in this slide, p and q is, is swapped. So sometimes that happens. Um, uh, but this should look very similar to basically the derivation of the VA we learned before, uh, because the VA is essentially optimizing some bound on the mutual information between Z and the, the underlying data distribution. Um, I think that's, I'm going to skip a few of these. I wanted to just talk about this beta VA as one final, one final thing. Um, Earlier in, the, earlier in the presentation, we talked about how the VAE actually achieves two things. So it's a generative model, but it's also a way to learn representations. And sometimes you care about one thing more than the other. Uh, and in cases like that, sometimes it's good to just do this thing where you add this, this beta term here. So it's a, it's a very simple change, uh, but the basic idea is Adding this term here lets you trade off between how well I'm recreating the image and how well um, that's, that z space is compressed. So sometimes we care more about having z um, be, a, be a fully compressive thing than we care about the actual uh, image generation quality, and sometimes vice versa. So this is just another helpful thing to, to play with. If you're training VAE models, sometimes it's helpful to add this beta term in here, play with different values if you care about one objective or the other. 
Uh, and then the experiments here show that if you, if you tune this beta parameter, we can get latent spaces that actually make sense. So this is in the, in the Gaussian latent space. You take one of the dimensions, um, or basically a, a linear direction in those directions, uh, and just add that to a, a sample Z. And some of those directions correspond to, to actual semantically meaningful things. So we can kind of find a, a delta in Z that corresponds to, to color, or to, to gender, or to, to other things. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head, so I don't want to say the wrong answer. Uh, it's, in, it's in the paper. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's it. So that's kind of just a quick overview. Mm -hmm. um, so back to the, uh, how do you determine the vacant space K? Because the vacant how do you determine K in the, in the VQV? So again, K is, is kind of a hyperparameter you want to decide ahead of time. There are some intuitions between why you would choose a lower K or a higher K. And, and the basic trade-off is if your K is higher, you will likely get better recreation during training. But it will also be harder to model that, that prior distribution, P of Z, uh, later. Something can be modeled with a smaller k. Is it possibly just more computationally simple? Is it less complex if it can be learned with k? I think there, I think there is something you can say about it. Again, I don't know off the top of my head, but uh, one way to think about k is that it's discrete bits. So I, if I can com if I can compress the full contents of a distribution into a set of bits, um, then I kind of have some some notion of you know, this data set contains this much uh, entropy. So if you can, in a, lo in a lossless way, compress into uh, to actual discrete bits, then you have, you have a real bound. Otherwise, it's kind of just an intuitive, like if I can get you know, this level of, of likelihood with a small k, then I kind of have a simpler distribution. Um, since we didn't cover it, but um, it might be worth quickly saying something about the relational lossy autoencoder and the pixel VAE, essentially that line of work. What that's saying is, imagine you have a VAE and you have an encoder, decoder, and you make your decoder very, very large, extremely large and very expressive. Let's say you make an extreme decoder that's an autoaggressive model itself. Then if you look at the bounds, what will happen is that um, you have a, such an expressive decoder, it will ignore Z. It will just generate one pixel at a time, because any time it does anything with Z, it's lossy because there's noise introduced on Z, so it's going to do less well at reconstruction. And so some of the things that you, um, that becomes surprising once you put a super expressive autoaggressive model as a decoder is that you actually have to handicap it to make sure it still uses the Z codes by doing dropout or reducing the, the depth or anything like that. So even though in principle you can just combine all these things together, there can be some unexpected side effects. So put a full autoaggressive model as uh, X given Z, all of a sudden it'll ignore Z, and that's, that's a problem, of course, because now your Z doesn't, doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, so that, that's kind of one, one interesting thing that um, that I, I guess um, is good to be aware of. And if you want to dive deeper, the variational lossy autoencoder and the pixel VAE papers, um, take a look at that and what you can do to, to resolve that issue. Perfectly bad model. Is that 
Yeah, so if you have b go to, let's say, like infinity, um, then the information in z has to be zero. So z has to perfectly match the, the unit Gaussian, which means it's, it's uninformative. Uh, and in that case, you're just trying to, to model p of, p of x directly, basically what we were doing back in the, in the autoregressive lecture. So if you think about the, the, the performance of, of a model that has no kind of information about the original x, it will be less, it will have worse log likelihoods than the model that can, um, that can condition on z, on an informative z. Uh, but depending on the beta term, like the trade-off between how, how expensive that, that computate, that information is in terms of the loss and uh, your, log, your log likelihoods will change. So the fact that we have interpretable or interpolable latent space is the side effect of imperfect models. Yeah, so one way to think about um, B is it's a, as a, something that encourages compression. So I can, maybe like the, the age variable, for example, uh, if I had infinite capacity, I would describe it as five independent variables. It would be like the color of my hair and then the, how thin my face is. Uh, but uh, if, if I'm penalized for leaking information through Z, those things are actually correlated. So it makes sense to represent them instead as, as one dimension. And so that has the side effects of leading to a kind of more interpretable uh, behavior in latent space because things that are more correlated in the data have to be merged into, into single kind of directions. Hmm? Uh, question about like the decoder being too expressive, I guess. Um, what is the problem here? Like, I guess if the decoder doesn't really look at Z, how is it able to reconstruct the input itself? So, yeah. yeah, so the same way that we, we, we implemented things uh, in the autoregressive lecture, where we can decode an image completely unconditionally, uh, you can get some, I mean, th there are ways to basically model distribution without using the, the inherent latent variable. Uh, they just won't be as good, because if you have some hints about what your, your actual image was, you can decode it a lot better than if you have to decode uh, based on the expectation over your whole data. So, Kind of one one kind of further intuition for the, for the issue with the powerful decoder is there is a bit of a, a chicken and egg problem where if the decoder learns to ignore Z, then no gradients will kind of flow into the encoder. And so the encoder will have no signal to, the, to even try to encode information, which means even if the kind of global maximum of my objective is to have some information there, uh, if the decoder is too powerful, that signal will not propagate down to the encoder. So you'll end up in a space where, where you don't want to be. You're essentially just converging to sort of the mean of the distribution. Not, not exactly the mean, but the, the kind of unconditional probability of, the, of that thing. Uh, what if we were attempting to generate something that's not inherently continuous, like something like more structured like a graph, for example? I yes. Guess how, would, uh, how would you approach that? Yeah. I think there, there are ways you can do that. So the, the, the encoder and decoder distributions don't have to be continuous. So in image spaces, they're continuous because images are continuous. Um, you can definitely have your decoder output, for example, uh, a discrete distribution over possible tokens, right? That's something you could do. Your input can also condition on these discrete tokens, uh, and you can compute log probabilities the way you always would. So basically, the answer is if you can, if you can still write down your data and, and calculate the, the probabilities of that data with your model, you can use the VAE setup. And I, there's, there, I'm sure there are some specialized things for graphs, for example, that 